stage cooking There's a tale to be told About a crop that's unusual Or so I've been told But was it just a lie? A tale spun by dreamers Reaching for the sky Was there a secret? A hidden history A story yet untold Or was it just the great lie? Or was it just the great lie? I'm in a field in Church Crookham in Hampshire very close to where I live and it's a typical English summer's day when I moved into the area, an elderly local told me that if I was standing in this field many years ago, I would probably have been surrounded by tobacco plants that were up to two metres tall. Now, I know what you're thinking. That can't possibly be true. And that's exactly what I thought. The land around here is mostly clay and often wet. And anyway, we all know that tobacco doesn't grow in England, don't we? My research into the history of locally grown tobacco took me down many paths, all of which led me to the man at the centre of my story, Arthur Brandon. In the last century, he became one of the largest growers of tobacco in England, and it was successfully sold as both pipe and cigarette tobacco. Arthur was born into a wealthy family in 1856 and inherited substantial assets after his father's death. He bought a failing Putney brewery and soon made it a success, acquiring several other breweries and their public houses. He not only had family money, but was now making his fortune from the brewery business. In 1896, at the age of 40, Arthur Brandon relocated his family from London when he bought Redfield's house in Church Crookham, Hampshire. It was then a country estate, complete with hunting forest and trout fishing, on its 148 acres of land. He later purchased several hundred more acres of adjoining land, including Velmi Dairy Farm and Home Farm, where he set about growing hops, corn, potatoes, as well as rearing pigs. History doesn't tell us why, but several years later, when Arthur was 55, he decided to experiment with growing tobacco. Enid Anderson, born in 1903, was the youngest of his four daughters. She was 76 when she recalled, My father began growing tobacco in 1911. When the crop was ripe, ready for harvesting, it was cut and taken down to home farm for drying, sorting and rehandling. It was then packed and weighed in the presence of customs officials. The packed and sealed hogsheads were then taken to the bonded warehouse in London. I remember the delightful smell of the plants drying slowly over the low ground fires, the smoke curling out of the canvas sides of the long open sheds. Initially a rebate against the duties enabled British growers to compete commercially with those in the colonies. But just when 140 acres were producing tobacco across the country, it was removed and the grant that replaced it in 1913 had the effect of stifling the industry. Nevertheless, Arthur Brandon persevered. During the First World War, cultivation all but ceased, growing only enough crops to produce seeds for the following year, and the drying sheds were used for army training under the command of Arthur's only son, Captain Chester Brandon. Sadly, both Chester and Arthur's nephew, Arthur Fulsham, who were set to take over the brewery business, were killed in action in the war. And Arthur subsequently sold the breweries. After the war, Brandon resumed cultivation on a much larger scale. He experimented with over 30 different varieties of tobacco, settling on just a few popular tastes, such as the Turkish flavour of Blue Prior. He had become president of the British Tobacco Growers Association, and lobbied the government, complaining that it was impossible for English growers to compete due to the wages being lower overseas and the costly red tape. 
he wrote, Even now I have to enter into a bond to grow, a bond to cure, a bond to receive tobacco, and a bond to send it away. We're even not allowed to use our waste products, which can be turned into insecticides. It has to be destroyed in the presence of an excise officer. He argued that tobacco growing made good use of poor quality land, and being labour intensive provided much needed employment. Most of the crop was sent to Stevenson Co of Salisbury, where the leaves were processed. The tobacco was well regarded, and the company announced that cigarettes made from Redfields Extra, an Egyptian type of tobacco, was as supplied to the Prince of Wales. Arthur had invested his own capital and effort into the project, and lobbied Parliament to give English growers a rebate. He argued that any reduction in revenue from duty would be offset by the reduction in unemployment payments, but it fell on deaf ears. English-grown tobacco was unlikely to be commercially viable, unless the Treasury had a change of heart. What seems so surprising is that, despite the English climate and poor quality of the land, Arthur Brandon was clearly very successful in growing and curing good quality tobacco in Church Crookham. All of which begs the question, why was I so surprised when I was first told that tobacco might have been grown here, in these fields in Hampshire? What made me, and no doubt many others, believe that tobacco can't possibly be grown in England? And so we uncover what has been referred to as the great lie. The origin and use of tobacco is reasonably well known. It's a plant indigenous to the Americas that was introduced into this country at the same time as the potato. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't Sir Walter Raleigh who first brought tobacco into England, although he can be credited with introducing smoking to Queen Elizabeth I. <coughs> it was some years earlier, in 1565, that the English naval commander, Sir John Hawkins, returned from Florida carrying the American plant. And before that, in 1560, it was introduced to France by Jean Nico, from whom both nicotine and the plant Nicotiana tobaccum get their names. During the 17th century, there were a large number of tobacco growers throughout the whole of England, and by 1659, tobacco was being extensively grown across 31 counties. It has even been reported that English tobacco was being exported to Holland and Belgium. It was at this time, in order to protect the tobacco producing colonies of Virginia and Maryland, and in particular the considerable associated customs revenue, the local growing of tobacco became a penal offence. It was during the presentation of this bill, prohibiting the planting, setting or sowing of tobacco in England and Ireland, that in 1660 the Speaker of the House spoke the words that were to become known as the Great Lie. This climate is so cold that it never comes to any maturity or perfection. We find, by experience, it is impossible to preserve it from putrefying above three to four months. Those words were to set the tone for all future government pronouncements. By the end of the 17th century, local growing of tobacco had become virtually non-existent. It wasn't our climate that was restricting the growing of tobacco. It was the 1660 law and the exceedingly harsh penalties for breaking it. Over many years, politicians tried without success to correct this untruth. The average person will say that it is impossible for tobacco to be grown under the gloomy skies of this country. Any expert can tell you that that is not the case at all. Tobacco can be grown here in England very well. After 250 years, the ban was finally lifted. Although tobacco growing and in particular its taxation, remained tightly controlled by the government. But even then, the great lie didn't go away. In 1947, the Chancellor of the Exchequer said, The United Kingdom is not a place in which to try to grow tobacco. 
This is not the climate for growing tobacco, and it would be a waste of valuable land. It is therefore not surprising that I, and probably many others, have been duped by this repeated misinformation. In a 1929 radio broadcast, Arthur stated what we now know. There is no great difficulty in growing tobacco in this country. Even with a small tax rebate, I know from my experience that tobacco can be grown profitably in England, giving employment to two men and casually one woman, for every acre grown, thus relieving unemployment. So, in some ways, what Arthur achieved was probably quite unremarkable. He simply demonstrated what had been known from the 16th and 17th centuries, that tobacco, like its close relative the potato, can readily be grown in the UK. For nearly 30 years last century, Arthur Brandon engaged on his journey of challenging officialdom, bureaucracy and convention. But for all that time, he was stifled by a government reluctant to relinquish the access to cheap overseas labour and the very attractive import tax. When Arthur died, age 81, in 1937, so too did tobacco growers' most vocal champion. The tobacco enterprise in Church Crookham pretty much died with him. In 1938, a year after his death, his 490-acre estate was sold and then split up. Home Farm, where the tobacco was taken to be dried, processed and cured, has now become Redfield's industrial park, and much of its land has become Redfield's garden centre and a development including a care home. The land from Velmead Farm has been transformed into Zebram Copse, a large housing estate, and more recently, a new housing development, Albany Park, between Zebram Copse and Redfield's house. The only real constant is Redfield's house, where Arthur and his family lived from 1896. Today, the building looks much the same except that it's no longer a private residence. It's now St Nicholas's School, and buildings have been added to the grounds. The old forge from Home Farm has also survived. It's now a residential property, very well hidden amongst similarly styled modern homes. Arthur Brandon's pretty much forgotten now. One has to look very hard to see the small clues to the existence of his enterprise. Seban Copps retains a memory of the tobacco business with some of the road names. But I wonder how many see that name daily without actually knowing anything about the man. Arthur was a man of determination who possessed both vision and foresight. He warned about the risks and consequences of importing from countries with low-cost labour and the stifling effect of customs duties and the government red tape. If I had been standing here, in this field, 90 years ago, it's most likely that I would have been hidden by Arthur Brandon's two-metre-tall tobacco plants. But instead, I'm standing in an empty field. There are no crops, there are no dairy cows or pigs, or any other livestock. Arthur Brandon's warning has become a reality, and the land that was once considered so precious is now simply cut for hay, or has been given over for construction. It's a sobering thought, and probably a fitting end to the story of a man who dared to try, and those who failed to listen. With hardly any exception, all stock and every crop that can be produced and grown in England can be produced and grown cheaper elsewhere. But until this country alters its decision to buy always in the cheapest market, I can see no reasonable chance of financial success in any agricultural proposition. <laughs>